We're in month two of the WGA strike. Um, and you've seen an incredible amount of solidarity from folks, um, whether it's Teamsters and truck drivers, whether it is um, people who work on sets like IATSE and, and the, the, the union of everyone who works on a on a set i'm like tell me what i also stands for um it's you know basically she, everybody who works on a set everyone who works on a set exactly and then who who had already negotiated their agreements um their their contract not so long ago and then now um actors who have voted to strike sag has voted to strike but is unclear if they will um go on strike but just sort of like tell us hmm i don't know where we want to start Tell us the why. Tell us the why of like at what it is to actually be a writer on a show, be and and trying as you have worked your way through the system and how that system is now kind of letting a lot of writers down. Yeah, I mean, when I first started, uh, I joined the guild in 2009. My first writing job was in 2009 and even then, which is I guess, you know, 14 years ago, uh, if you were lucky enough to get on a show, you were going to work enough weeks so that uh, even if you had trouble securing employment on your next show, uh, you had enough money to kind of like float you to your next job. You right. were working enough weeks, you were being paid enough so that you could live in Los Angeles and right. try to do what is a highly competitive job. You know, there are hundreds of that, literally hundreds of thousands of people in just this city trying to do this job. And so that's how it was when I first broke in. If you were lucky enough to get in, then you were going to live a good life in Los Angeles. And right. Then, because the jobs weren't, they're not coming down the pike like crazy. They're going to be there. You're going to be able to relax a little bit on like one or two jobs a year. Yeah. It, oh, really one job a year. You're uh -huh. you able to live on one job a year because you were either doing 13 episodes or you were doing 22 episodes. And that meant you were working 32 weeks or you were working 44 weeks, right? And at that, at the, at our rates of, on those number of weeks, you could live in Los Angeles comfortably. Yeah. It was a really good job. It was a really good job. Um, and then what happened was essentially Netflix changed, began to change the model. Netflix decided, you know, we're going to spend a ton of money on content as much. We're going to just get way over our skis on content and we're mm. going to build this platform where it's going to be so big that then once we've spent all this money on conflict on content, we're going to be able to have enough subscribers. It's all going to like come out in the wash and we're going to be highly profitable. I mean, you've heard this story in corporate America a million fucking times, right? It's like move fast, break things. And then, you know, then you'll be, then worry about how you're going to monetize it later. Right. And everyone else started chasing that. Everyone thought that that was the model. And then what began to happen was as there became more and more streaming services, they all needed more and more content. They all wanted less and less episodes per show. And so Jobs. Why Why that, though, Justin? Like, I don't understand why suddenly cut back the number of episodes per show because, because it's on streaming. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing if you're doing 22 episodes of a show, that costs a lot of money. So that show better be hugely popular. But if you're just trying to figure out I need new content every week that every week, if I'm going to compete in the streaming wars, I need new shows to launch every week. I need several new shows to launch every week. And so instead of doing 22 episodes or even 13 episodes of a show, they're like, we're going to have six shows and they're all going to do 10 episodes. Jesus. And so what ended up happening was all these jobs that were, you know, 32 weeks or 40 weeks, they started disappearing. And then the studios realized, well, we're spending way too much money on content. So we've got to figure out a way to reduce the amount of money we're spending on labor and still make the same amount of content. And so the invention of this thing called mini rooms started. And essentially what that was, was back in the day, the studios used to make, they'd, they'd buy a certain number of shows and mm -hmm. then they'd have all those writers write a script, a pilot script. And if they liked that pilot script, then they'd shoot that pilot. And then out of that batch of pilots that they chose to shoot, then they'd pick up some of them to series, mm -hmm. right? And they decided, well, actually, then when they go to series, sometimes they fail. That's just the, the way of the business, right? They decided, well, you know, a better way to do this would be to say, 
let's get as much data about these shows as possible. Let's have a writer come in, we'll buy their script, and then we'll tell them, we're not going to pick up your show to series and spend all this money. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have you and maybe like two or three other writers work for like eight or 10 weeks, and you guys are going to break out the entire show and write a few episodes, and you're going to do it at guild minimum because you're not producing. So if you're not producing, we don't have to pay you your actual writer-producer fee. We're going to pay you the smallest fee that is actually legally allowed in our business <laughs> for 10 weeks. You're going to do the most important work that is ever done on a television show, which is breaking the entire show. Right. And, th and then we'll decide after that whether we even want the show to go to series. And if we do want it to go to series, well, thanks for writing half of it at Guild Minimum. Now we're, we don't need any of you. We only need like two or three of you. And so that and that's what's been happening in our business. So suddenly it takes two or three jobs a year right for, for someone to make enough money to live in los angeles to do the hardest part of what otherwise would have been a 32 week job it, like you do is it actually going from 20, 32 weeks to 10 weeks in some cases it's 6 weeks in some cases i've heard of like they have they have put together a mini room for 4 weeks and then 2 Jesus. weeks and Jesus then, Christ. And so more and more and more. It's 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 the classic story that's happening all over our country with labor, which is they've just they're trying to they realize at a certain point, all of these streamers realized that there there's not an unlimited number of subscribers. And they had promised their stockholders that there would be. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly their stock there has started to fall in certain places in, uh, for certain companies. And it's all in a in an effort to juice their stock price. And so they realized, oh, well, then we're going to have to cut costs. We're going to have to cut where we can, and that's labor. So if we can trim labor, then we can show growth in other areas that aren't just subscriber base, and we can juice our stock prices. Absolutely. And welcome, Nato Green, to the pod. Uh, missed you in the first segment, but you're back. And and. I, the other thing they're doing, which is so sad, Netflix cracking down on like password sharing. So my mom's like, what's our Netflix? And I was like, there's no hour anymore, mom. But yeah, it, it is interesting that it was just this like crazy over promise of money making and that streaming would make everyone rich as if, I don't know, as if, I guess I'm trying to compare like, and, and we can talk about the labor angle of this, but I just want to talk about like the money angle What's making more? Aren't they making way more money now than they were before? Or way more money? They're yeah. <laughs> making way more money. In two thousand three, the they had made a combined five billion dollars in profits. This year, they're going to make around. This is a, a quote unquote down year. They're going to make twenty eight billion dollars in profits. They're still making insane amounts of money, and that's what we're saying. Is people sometimes look at what we're doing and they're like, "Oh, you're just trying to, you know." get money where there isn't. And and if you look at everything, every proposal we have, what we're saying is, if you're not making money on something, we're not asking for any money. But right. what we're saying is, if you're making money off of the product that we make, the only product that you have, we would like a percentage of that that's fair and equitable. Yeah. NATO, um, we're just talking about, uh, the, we're giving sort of the broad strokes of everything in terms of the strike and sort of what writers are asking for. Yeah, Justin, what's the deal with capitalism? Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, hi, Justin, good to see you. So sorry for crashing late. Uh, the, oh, no. so, the, so um, one of the things that's been so powerful about the current guild strike is sort of talking about, about you know, how the spread of gig work is is penetrating all areas of our lives. Um, so can you talk about like sort of the human impacts on writers that, I mean, I think there's a perception that, you know, that, that, that entertainment is created by, um, you know, trust fund, college educated Jews um, and, you know, S some of my best friends and whatnot, but um, <laughs> the, uh, but but some of us are also still struggling to to make payments on our on our second home and whatnot. Can you talk about sort of what how how the shift the shift in towards gig work for writers, like what that's done to to the average writer as opposed to like your you know the 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 people the handful of people who are at the top of the industry. Yeah, I, that's a great point. I mean, I would say for a large percentage of our guild now, 
they are having trouble putting together enough money to live in Los Angeles and not have to get a second job. There are so many of the of our writers now, and this was never the case. I mean, TV writing was and screenwriting was if you could get in, you were making a really good living. And now it's the case where I know so many writers who, I mean, I just, we, I, I, my old assistant, she got a job uh, on a show. She was staffed for 12 weeks. And then when that was over, she had to go back and get a writer's PA job because she, she couldn't find, she didn't have enough money to float her to her next job. And she didn't have enough, she couldn't find another job quick enough writing. So she just went back and took another job. And she said, if I get another writing job, I'm not sure I can quit it, quit the job that I'm at for that job. Mm -hmm. so what's happening is, it's funny you bring up trust funds. It's like, if, if we don't fix this problem, the only people who are going to be able to work in the entertainment industry are people with rich parents. Right, right. Because they're the only ones who are going to be able to like, just sit and write and not have to get another job while they wait the interminable amount of time it takes to get a job sometimes. And, yeah. and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but in 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 recent years, there's been a pretty profound push to like open up the doors to to you know people of color and and women and people from all kinds of different backgrounds to be able to have access to writing jobs that they didn't have access to because they didn't go to the same like you know uh, uh, socialist summer camp in Wisconsin. Um, uh, the so you know and so, like particularly around during the agency campaign a few years ago, like there was all these things around, around removing gatekeepers and that kind of stuff. So it's, I mean, it almost seems like they want to ruin the jobs just as soon as people of color are showing up. Right, right, that's, right. That's exactly right. And, and I think that's the thing I always say, like these, these studios have these programs to help out women and writers of color. And, and the best way to help out women and writers of color is to make it so that when they get a job, it pays them enough to stay in our industry. What we're seeing now is that, just as we're just as we're starting to try to have people from you know minority groups become a part of this guild, they're washing out because they're not making enough money to live. And so, right. if you're a studio and you are committed to helping women and, and writers of color, the best way to do that is to pay them a living wage. Yeah, and it's it, worse because it they true. they want the stories, right? They want to have like you know they're like you know, Black History Month stories like on the feed and the timeline and the Pride Month stuff. They want to leech off all like the experiences and the stories, um, but then underpay people or make it a precarious job and whatnot. Let's talk about like the quality, right? Let's talk about and the the looming chat GBT. What I did hear is that the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, AM AMPTP, that they were like, oh, when it comes to AI, um, I think their deal and their offer to you all was we'll just we'll just visit revisit it every year. We'll just talk about it every year. We'll we'll chat we'll have a check in. Meanwhile, ChatGBT is like rapidly just in the last three months um, getting more and more robust. And I know if people come down on different sides, they're like, oh, they could never do a succession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, some of the bullshit on these streaming services, you wonder, right? It doesn't. It, it's. It is very, and I want to talk about unscripted in a little bit, but like they could absolutely replace some of that content with a bot. But what are your thoughts on that? And what what is WGA saying on that? So, yeah, I mean, what we're essentially saying is we, we will not allow writers to be replaced by what is essentially plagiarism, right? Like an AI doesn't create anything with any intent. An AI doesn't have a point of view. What an AI is doing is it's a mathematical formula and it's giving us the average, you type in, I want a procedural about cops. It's going to give you the average of all of the work that's already been done before in that, right? And so, you know, when their offer was, hey, let's talk about it every year, essentially that's saying to us like, hey, there's this giant fucking monster and we, pro <laughs> and we promise for a year, we won't attack you with it. But when it's way stronger and angrier in a year, then let's talk. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's when you'll unleash it on us. <laughs> so I think right now, like the, the concern is, you know, they let it, they, they said to our co negotiating chair and executive said to David Goodman, uh, well, I don't know why you guys are worried about AI. You guys will write the good stuff and AI will write the bad stuff. And David's response was just so funny. It was like, 
a lot of us write the bad stuff. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that, that, but, but let's be real, that you as these studio executives insist on dumbing down and only take chances on some of the lowest common denominator bullshit. You know, like, I'm just, this is me just saying that like, it's not, the, the bad stuff is not coming because that's what the writers are pitching. It's no. what the studio execs are fucking, you know, yeah, signing it's like off if, on. If, you know, if they can, if they can use robots to cut their, you know, to, to make a similar amount of profit with worse quality, right? that's what they're going to do. Well, that's all it is, really. It's just how do we further erode uh, labor? You know, how do we, how do we continue to make product for less and less and less money? And that's why, you know, there, there is, we can't accept a, sh a, a conversation once a year. We can't accept good you know sort of their their word that this is not going to replace us because at, at every turn as we've seen data has shown that if they can find a place to cut a corner on how much they're spending and how much they're making they will and mm -hmm. so i think for us you know writers it is hard to st stare at a blank page and write something it is not coal mining but it is a it is a difficult job and at and what AI is doing is taking all of the things that writers have done over the many, many years that we've been working, all the times we've stared at blank page, and essentially just ripping it off and repackaging it. And what we're saying is that's not, we're not going to allow that to replace what we do. Yeah. And, and I, the things that just, I want to say also the things that like the, the fact that writing even has been a good job in Hollywood historically is thanks to the Writers Guild. Yeah, every time we have struck, we have won something incredibly important. I mean, 2007, was, that was the last time there was a writer's strike, and we were striking over coverage of the internet. And at the time, everyone was going at our leadership saying, this is bullshit, there, is no, there are no shows on the fucking internet, what are we fighting for, what are you guys fighting for, why are you holding up all Hollywood? And even for a couple of years afterwards... There ha there weren't really any shows on streaming. Now over fifty percent of the work we do is covered by that contract we won in two thousand and seven to cover the internet. So mm -hmm. I think that's when when people say like, well, AI is not doing anything right now, and I say to them, well, the internet wasn't sh you know showing wasn't the streamers weren't everywhere and ubiquitous in two thousand and seven either, but we right. saw what was coming. Right. I, I mean, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because because I, I wanted to just ask if you could, uh, if you have other reflections on what's changed between 2007. Like, what are the what are the lessons learned that feel applicable to what you're facing now, and what are the what are the things that feel like new conditions that you're facing now compared to what was what 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 we dealt with in, in 2007. Well, I think one of the new conditions is that there are members of the AMPTP whose core business is not making. TV shows and movies, right. you know, like we're now, we're no longer in 2007, we were negotiating against a, a group of, of studios, legacy mm -hmm. studios, and their core business was making television and movies. Uh, and now there is this, the AMPTP has, it has Amazon in it. It has Apple in it. Um, it has Netflix in it. And so it's got a lot of tech companies in it, Apple and Amazon. This is like such a tiny, tiny percent of their, business and so there but they're if they're insisting on negotiating together and it's funny because you know those companies don't like each other there's they don't want the other to succeed they're all in competition with each other but if they insist on negotiating together then we're not going to give a deal based on their weakest members we're holding them all accountable to this mm -hmm. you know and so that's that's one thing that's been really really challenging. They're like, behemoths. They're he, they're even more consolidated than they were in two thousand and seven, right? It's NBC Universal, Time Warner, uh, Discovery, fucking like it's they're even bigger than they were back then. And they've yeah they've merged and and they're yeah it's it's just a it's an unwieldy group I would say. I mean that you know that's that is what's interesting about that to me. I, so just I, I'm I'm a, the, a hybrid comedian and union negotiator. Um, so not I mostly don't deal with entertainment, but uh, although I am negotiating over a radio station right now. But um, the, uh, the you know one of the sort of principles about union negotiations is that 
the employer side, even when you're dealing with a single employer, is never unified. Um, the And so it's both challenging that you have this diverse group and you have these giant mega mergers and these huge, you know, corporations um, and you're dealing with Amazon as well as, you know, Time Warner, whatever. At the same time, it's also an opportunity because, you know, their their internal divisions and internal ultimately what's going to what will happen and the way that a resolution will occur is the internal tensions with the employer group will start to intensify um, and people will turn on each other. And then that's mm. that that's when the contract will settle. Pitting uh, the elites against one another. Right. Is, you know, is at some point and it, who knows which direction it'll break. But, you know, Apple is going to say, you know, we don't care about Ted Lasso that much. This isn't our fight. Fuck you guys. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, In, yeah. I was just going to say, is I, think, I think that they're, you know, what we're sort of hoping is that someone within that leadership, with some, someone in the leadership of these companies is the one to realize we can't lose any more mm. money. We can't lose this battle in terms of two of these other companies and that we have to broker some sort of deal. Because what we're asking for is, is really not that much. We're asking yeah. for, we're actually not even asking, you asked me what's new. We haven't, we're not asking for anything that's really new. We're asking for some protections we've had. And we're not even asking to turn the system back to the way that it was in 2009 and every order has to be 22 episodes. Like, we're not saying that. We're saying, give us back some of the things you've taken from us over the last 15 years. Right. Yeah. And so does that, in terms of mini rooms, in terms of residuals, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, but, and then maybe talk about how much distance there is between, you know, the AMPTP and, and the WGA. Yeah. So uh, honestly, on, on several of our core issues, I couldn't tell you what the distance is because they refused to counter. They literally just refused to engage with the proposal. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So you, I, as a negotiator, I, I would describe that as a distance of 100%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say currently that is a distance of 100%. Um, and then on some of the things, for instance, like mini rooms, what we've said is if you're going to have a mini room, then there needs to be a huge premium paid to the writers who are working these much shorter orders. Right. It should, be the, it should be more money, not less money. Yeah, and so what they're offering is 5% above scale was what was the offer that they gave us, which is not in anywhere near, it might as well be 100% uh, uh, difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think it's a situation where, where, you know, they have not come back. The ball is in their court. They have not come back to the, the table. Um, and so we took this labor action and, and we're hopeful that... Uh, they'll come back and engage on these proposals and actually negotiate with us. I've been hearing that because it's streaming, unlike in 2007, it's not, there's not like an urgency, you know, to fill a time slot uh, like there was, whereas now it's like, wow, ah, there's endless amounts of stuff because we've extracted all this labor from our amazingly talented writers for so many years. Um, so that they're not feeling the squeeze, but that at the same time, w WGA members and allies have also blockaded productions and ha and Teamsters are on board. So what is your sense in terms of that, like on the ground kind of, are they feeling the heat um, in terms of the, your, the labor action? They've definitely felt the heat on productions that, that we've been able to shut down. And that is a huge, I just want to point out like the Teamsters and IATSE have, been heroic in what they've done because we're on a we're on a, it's not their strike and they yeah. have said they they will not cross picket lines and they have been the ones who have shut down the shows because when we pick it in in conjunction with them then they don't cross our picket line and that's how shows shut down and teamsters and iatsi are losing pay because of this they are taking like the bravest stance you can take they're supporting a fellow union in this labor action and it is it is fucking heroic. Like the, the, the Teamsters and IATSE have gone so far above and beyond. And it was something that we didn't, we didn't really have in 2007, that same sort of uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. And so this doesn't happen. We aren't able to hurt the studios in the way that we have been this time without the collaboration of the Teamsters and, and IATSE. I mean, the, I, I'm sure this is going to be like, this might be too esoteric for the average situation 
listener, but uh, you know, a year it was a year ago. IATSE almost went on strike and yeah. didn't. And uh, and I know that there was a lot of internal turmoil within within the union about that. My, you know, I think that it, just as an observer, I think it's likely that there's going to be bylaw changes around how they handle ratifications, so that that you know, I think uh, there were num- enough members that felt like they got their legs cut out from under them in that contract fight that there, that that residual appetite to 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 struggle and to oppose the industry is sort of you mm. know like they th- this th- the the writers guild strike is their opportunity to have the fight that they didn't get to have they last want year. Yeah. yeah 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 because it's existential for everybody it really is i mean it's happening in every sector of the business it's happening everywhere and i think that you're gonna see my my feeling, and, and I, you know, I could be wrong, but I, I, I do feel like the MPTP sort of misread the moment of labor in this country. Yes. And I don't know that they thought that it was going to be the fight that it has become. Um, because I think in every industry, I think the, the heads of these companies are so detached from labor that they, I don't think they're really understanding what's happening on the ground. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you might have UPS workers go on strike this summer. It might be a hot. It's another hot labor summer. Uh, and, and 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 SAG voted. SAG after voted. And SAG voted. Yeah, it's it's SAG has some major major issues that they want to address, and I'm really proud of the way that they mobilized so quickly. You know, that's a guild of 160,000 people. The Writers Guild is a guild of 11,000 people. For them to be able to get a strike authorization vote at that high of a percentage with that turnout. That's going to absolutely make the MBTP shit their pants. I mean, that is an impressive thing that this what that SAG did, and I think it's going to end up just paying giant dividends to their members. So I, I think it's amazing. Yes, it, it really feels like a last stand. And and the the the, the way I kind of come into this is like, um. I do a lot of unscripted stuff, right? Like trying to sell myself as a host and whatnot, and like. Um, I've even been pitching a sh- an unscripted show that is kind that is, and, and this is what I want to get to. Even when something is unscripted, it's heavily scripted. So, and then the other thing that I do is internet content, and and you know I've worked for like AJ Plus and you know like online writing, which has never, um, uh, with the exception I believe Vice might have um, unionized with WGA, but they like writers are not, and a lot of journalists have not unionized do not have unions are not representative you are um you know like if there's a strike against zaslav in um in fucking cnn or, or or time warner like all the cnn reporters or the writers and whatnot they're not they're not unionized you know so it's it's interesting who like i feel like it's the rest of us are kind of turning heads and being and being like oh wow okay you know and i think it is um also important to be like unscripted r- shows are also heavily scripted. If you watch a reality show, you're like, oh yeah, that's reality show is not scripted. No, it's fucking scripted. There's tons of writing that goes into an unscripted show. Um, so all to say, if and when this is one, there's a lot more to come for. I think so. I totally think so. And it's funny because, you know, now that Amazon and Apple are, are part of the AMPTP, it's like they have their own relationships with labor and unions. Right. You know? uh, and I would think, if I were them, if I were the AMPTP, I would probably not have wanted to kick this hornet's nest because the effect of this, I think, will be you you have 11,000 members whose whole job is writing and messaging and putting narratives out into the world. Right. That's what we've been doing for the last month and a half. And if you don't think that that is having residual effects on other workers, labor in completely different parts of the country and parts of the world, you're mistaken. And I think that they essentially fucked with the wrong people. What's going on, Frantifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.